Bitcoin is close to becoming worthless. Now, what's the Bitcoin? Bitcoin's like rat poison. Yeah. Oh. The greatest scam in history. Let's get it. Bitcoin will go to fucking zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you ungovernable misfits. I'm your host, Max. Everybody knows that Bitcoin is useless, worthless, and doomed to fail. But what if everyone's wrong? What if it's the system that is doomed to fail? Join me as I speak to some of the brightest people in the space and slither to the deepest, darkest depths of the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Welcome back to Bitcoin Monthly, a show where Bitcoin Q&A, Antimus and I go through all the month's news items and anything that we think is important in the Bitcoin and open source space. It's almost impossible to keep up with all of this stuff unless you are working in this full time. Even then, it's difficult. So I hope you find this useful. Anyone who's listening to this who has questions, you can reach out and ask questions on Fountain. Any sats and comments are much appreciated and we're starting reading them from this show onwards. We cover updates from Blue Wallet, BitGo, Envoy, Nunchuck, Sparrow, PDK. We go through the HRF bounties and we discuss Kraken being ordered to hand over all user data to the IRS. This shouldn't surprise any of you, but it's happening. The UK government are also trying to ban all encryption. So now more than ever, it's really important for people to start learning to use the tools, start using open source software and protect yourself and your families from the bullshit that's coming. Before we start, I just want to say a big thank you to my sponsors. Let's start with my newest sponsor, SX6 Metal Bitcoin Seed Phrase Backup Plates. Quite a mouthful, but very simple. You stamp your seed into steel. And you do this in case you had a fire or a flood or anything else that could fuck up those 12 or 24 words. You do not want to lose these. You want to keep them safe and stamping them into steel is the best way you can do this. Black Coffee is the man behind SX6. So I know these things are quality. I've held them in my hand. I have felt them and they really are amazing. So if you're upgrading your setup or you still have your backup on paper, just do better. Go to sx6.store. You can use the code MAXBBB. That will get you 10% off your order. And you can reach out and ask me if you have any questions. But these are great and so is black coffee. Go and buy some. Next up is foundation devices. Foundation devices are making my favorite hardware. Not only is it the most beautifully designed, but it is fully open source and they've just dropped the price to $199. These things really are simple to use. Any fuckwit can secure their sats properly with one of these and they have an amazing team. If you have any problem setting one of these up, you also have the option to have Bitcoin Q&A hold your hand through the process, but honestly, you're not gonna need that. This is a cypherpunk tool for fuckwit. Anyone can use it. Check them out at foundationdevices.com. You can use the shill code bit by bit. And yeah, if you have any questions at all, you can reach out and ask me. They are a sponsor because I chase them, because I think they are the best. If you haven't already got one of these, maybe it's time to upgrade your security. Go to foundationdevices.com. Last but not least, Fast Bitcoins. Fast Bitcoins are actually, I think, sponsoring not just this show, but the Bitcoin Beach Retreat as well. Fast Bitcoins are a KYC exchange. So I do tell everyone, if you can avoid it, avoid it go and buy in cash go and mine 
go and buy off a friend, do it peer to peer, then you're not gonna be in the system. But I know not everyone is gonna to listen to that advice. Or not all of you care. Some of you want to have some KYC sat. If that is the case, you really need to make sure that you go to the best people possible. You wanna make sure they do everything that they can to keep your data safe and to keep you secure. Fast Bitcoins do not want to hold your sats, they push you to get your sats off exchange. Once you've done that, you can go and get a passport, you can go and get one of these plates from SX6 and then you are fully self-sovereign. If you are gonna go and buy some Bitcoin and you're gonna use an exchange, please go to fastbitcoins.com. I don't think I have a shill code, but you can just mention me and I'm sure they'll look after you. All right, on with the show. Just give me one sec, I'm just pouring my coffee. Was that coffee number four of the day? Must be by now, it's like nine o'clock. Genuinely, this is the first one. Oh, wow. I've been brewing it and waiting, it's probably cold actually by now, but I've been waiting so that I have my first. The enjoyable part of the morning starts with you two. Isn't that nice? That is wonderful. Lying through your fucking teeth. Yeah, I actually have a bone to pick with Antimus, to be honest with you. I brought it up a little bit in the last recording. You know, I said, you know, he was getting a bit big for his boots and no longer thinks he needs to respond to friends. Been ignoring me again. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I've been messaging him, actually trying to send him some business as well, and nothing. Just reads it and then goes, do you know what? I've got so many other things that are important and you are so low on my list that I can't even be bothered to respond. And then he just fucks around in the mountains. I see little pictures of him hiking around, (laughs) ignoring me. And I just think, you fucking horrible bastard. It makes me sad. We'll just get that out of the way to start. I can see a trend forming here. It's uh, poor mm. behaviour. I did notice in those pictures, though, did you notice that he had his uh, phone out with trading view open? Like, he wasn't letting those shitcoin mm. trades fall by the wayside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Priorities, isn't it? Good morning, lads, to you too. Morning, Oh, hey, how's it going? <laughs> nice to hear from you, mate. Yeah. Been dead silence for a while. <laughs> a bit shocked here. Man, I have my Starlink with me to have... Uh, reception throughout the hike where were you hiking is that public knowledge or is it yeah it was like in the in this uh north of italy up in the alps nice uh, i don't know what you call it in english it's it's like Zut tirol uh south tirol i don't no idea <laughs> yeah but it's, it mean, it's beautiful up there four days full on four and a half thousand uh elevation meters uh so that was uh pretty pretty rough uh, on my feet so uh, it's been a rehab week very nice yeah pictures looked awesome oh man yeah notice you were uh, repping the seed signer hat as well oh yeah yeah that's one he uh inadvertently uh gifted me last year when he when he came by to visit. Him, eh? um he uh, just like forgot it in the cart <laughs> i dropped him off nice. um so <sighs> there we go max you back we can hear you now oh you were Max, gone? we can hear you now. Hello? <laughs> we heard the sigh. We heard the sigh and the telegram message saying, can you hear me? <laughs> Good start. See, this is because you're not on coffee number four, Max. <laughs> not on your game. Is that you making that scraper noise or is that Max? That's not me. Max, we can hear you. you click in. Can you hear that? As I'm speaking now, you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. I can't hear either of you at all. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. I might have to send a new link. Sorry. No worries. No idea why. Oh, good. I disconnected my VPN. I tried to change it. Both of you were coming through like robots. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Maybe it's the connection. And then once I changed connections, it just, I couldn't hear you anymore. I see. More technical issues. Well, the uh, the Antimus ribbing is going to be lost in the archives. The listeners are not going to be able to hear that one. Oh, no, man, no, I still got it. Mate. Don't you worry about that, mate. <laughs> oh, you're going gonna... to chop it. You're going to chop it all together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone's going to know that you've just ignored me. I thought we were friends. <laughs> uh... The joys of editing. <laughs> so what's your excuse then 
Well, brace yourselves. None, obviously, excuses. No excuses here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you're a shit bloke and I don't shit. like you, so I'm not going to bother responding. That's fair enough. At least I'd like the honesty. <laughs> no excuses, absolutely. Uh, no, I apologize for that. And um, I think, uh, well, there's something we, we may have to discuss uh, regarding um, the contents of that message uh, later on. Okay. Very cryptic. I was going to say, now I'm intrigued. Yeah, yeah, it's very dull, I can assure you. Yeah. Hang around for afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and what were you doing hiking in the mountains? Was there some sort of Pokemon Go contest? Or... <laughs> <laughs> that would have been sweet. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, just uh, getting my head free and uh, just with a, with a good mate. Um, four nice. days from from one little hut to the next. Ooh. Having a whole bunch of knudel, thats what they call it here. What's that? Knudel. Uh, it's cuddles. <laughs> <laughs> They're like balls of food. Okay. And <laughs> you're making it sound lovely. <laughs> and yeah, and they they like put like a whole bunch of different stuff in. So it's it's like a kind of a grain mixture um cooked up and then you could like put like different um like you put um uh like uh, different vegetables inside or like different um meat stuff uh, like grained up and mash it okay. all together and have like sauce on top and like everyone like meat down there <laughs> yeah but it's not just meat so it's, there's a whole bunch of like grain stuff inside right, um, right, right. and then it's just like mixed in and then you get like uh, there's some with like beetroot and spinach and all that kind of stuff okay. and um different sauces and everyone eats that down there so we had that for four days straight um for, <laughs> like, in the morning you get like sweet ones um and then midday and in the evening so uh that was, that was, yeah, um, i've had enough of them <laughs> <laughs> cleared your head done some nice walking feeling better hell yeah 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 yeah. rejuvenated good what about you q and a you rejuvenated or still fucked still fucked always fucked still fucked always yeah, fucked. coffee number seven for me so far keep it consistent now 10 past 9 a.m that is for, for the <laughs> listeners yeah. uh, no all good all good um yeah just uh Nothing really, uh, no no big news. Um, oh, I treated myself to a Pixel tablet the other day. Oh, and, you folded. Well, I didn't get the fold. I got the tablet instead. Mm. But Yeah, that's nice. Threw Graphene OS on it uh, immediately. <laughs> and to my surprise, it works absolutely flawlessly. I've been really? blown away by it, yeah. So I've been running Calyx on my Pixel phone for well over two years. So I haven't touched anything Graphene for a long time. and. It's come on such a long way. So stable, the granularity you get in terms of the settings and the fact that it works so well out of the box on a device that's only been on the market for like a month or so. Absolutely blown away by it. And uh, yeah, it's a fantastic bit of kit. So really happy with that and happy with how Graphene is performing on it. And it has cemented the idea that the next pixel that I get, because mine's going to be running out of security updates uh, in a couple of months, unfortunately, because it's an older one. Um, okay. I'll definitely be going for graphene on, on whichever new pixel I get for sure. Really, really impressed with it. So um, yeah, I think uh, there's opportunity there for a guide as well as when I do up my, update my phone. So I've got mm-hmm. one for Calyx, but not for, for graphene. So I think I'll seize the opportunity and, and uh, pump out a guide on doing that because um, I think mobile privacy is, uh, is an important one. You know, we use these devices literally every day probably way mm-hmm. too much most of us and you know just having the option to be able to opt out of the war gardens and the, the ecosystems that are literally collecting and selling your data um mm-hmm. is, is is important today and becomes more important each and every day as we hurtle headfirst into 1984 so really happy to to see how it's performing and was really shocked i just thought the combination of an alternative to Google plus a brand new device. I thought it was going to be a bit of a shit show and I was preparing myself for the worst, but I was absolutely pleasantly surprised. Good to hear. And was it as easy as people say to flash now? Did you still do the command line stuff or did you just go on the website and flash it from there? Yeah, the web installer makes it so easy. Like it's it's almost not going to be worth me doing a guide just on how to do it because mm. it's so simple. I will do the guide because I'll I'll sort of take people through on, you know, tips and tricks on getting the best out of it and settings and apps and open source alternatives to you so that it will be benefit to it but purely just installing it like it's so easy even you could do it 
Really? Mm-hmm. I'm confident <laughs> that if I gave you a Pixel phone and a USB cable, you'd be able to do it. Wow. Well, that, that is simple. Really saying something. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I did graphene last time? Yes. I well, did it, graphene yeah. like yeah. fucking three years ago and it <laughs> took me... In fact, in total, it was like weeks because I tried flashing it following one of Odell's guides he did on it. And then I was like, oh, he's done it on Linux. I don't have a Linux machine. So I was like, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll put Linux on a Raspberry Pi. And then (laughs) using that, I'll then flash it. Da, 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 da. I kept trying to do it. It wasn't working. And then I asked Odell, I was like, why is it not working? He was like, oh, I'm not sure. Let me reach out to someone. Oh, it's because it's not on x86. It's on such and such. I, was like, I think it was fuck. me you reached out to, actually. That sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> and, then, and then I was like, oh, okay. I found a guide where I could do it on a Mac but it was in Chinese, and then there was someone who'd, who translated the Chinese. So anyway, long story short, it took me a fucking days and days and days and days and days, and I finally did it. And now, however many years later, three years later or whatever it sounds like, uh, I could do that with a coffee in the morning and probably not even have to message you. It's not even a 15-minute job. It's, wow. You pl- plug it into a laptop. Go to the wet the installer, which is like grapheneos.org slash install. There's like three buttons to click on there with your mouse, a couple of taps on the tablet or the phone itself, and it just does it all for you. <laughs> it's Amazing. so, so easy. Yeah. Nice. How's the, um, how are the guides going? Like with the different ones that are up at the moment? Yeah. So since we last recorded, I think there's, uh, three to three that have come out. Uh, the first one was a collaborative post that, uh, I did with a NIM called Expatriotic. That one was on Blixed Wallet, which is a, a mobile first uh, non-custodial lightning app that kind of somewhat similar to Phoenix, where you, you run kind of a lightweight node on your phone and then you have the opportunity to either create your own channels with other nodes or you can use a, a lightning service provider to take the easy route and just have them manage t- channels on on your behalf so he kind of uh, got the ball rolling with that one and then just got um, a bit swamped with life so i kind of picked up the mantle and finished that one off so that was a fun one to write and then the other two are from a guy who's fast becoming a legend in my eyes once again uh, mr bit levy he's done two more no kyc guides first one was on agora desk uh, which is a peer-to-peer exchange, and they also have a mobile application as well. And more recently, just a couple of days ago, in fact, he's done one on uh, Azteco Bitcoin vouchers, which I know a lot of uh, people are big fans of. They've been around for a long, long time. So that guide sits right at home within the NoKYC section of Bitcoiner.guide. So yeah, massive shout out to, to BitLevy and Expatriotic for getting involved and you know helping me pump out more great content. The, the guys are, are awesome. So thank you to them. I had uh, expatriotic on the show a few months ago. It's a good guy. He is. I enjoyed that one. Yeah, he's. Uh, I like some. I like some of his takes. Cool. Well, what have we got on the list? Looks like a relatively short one. Yeah, not too many points. Um, but I mean, definitely enough to chat about to get started. We've got Blue Wallet v six point four point six. They've added some new languages and also support for scanning CQR backups this is uh, definitely a cool a step to see that um being propagated uh, throughout multiple projects and mm-hmm. obviously I mean, for people using blue wallet as a mobile hot wallet um you kind of um, won't be using this in like everyday life but um as like a way to uh, recover um at some point that's a good option to have it's a bit similar to the way that uh with sparrow as well you can uh, um import your your cqrs there as well um you could obviously also use um your phone as like an offline device uh, in mm-hmm. a setting like that as well instead of a hardware wallet what's your feeling on that running through a scenario if someone has a passport they flush it down the toilet whatever something goes wrong they've got a backup plate and they're like fuck i need to get my hands on these sats now do you have any worries about restoring into a mobile wallet if that's say that's someone's life savings what would be your advice would you wait get a new hardware wallet that you know is going to be offline hasn't touched the internet just in case or would you be like nah it's it's pretty secure well, it kind of depends a bit on the amount you're talking about here. Life savings. Life savings. And like if you don't have 
like if your time preference isn't that high and you have to like do a huge payment, then I'd always advise either just getting a new device and waiting for that to, to arrive again so you can recover that way. If you're more pressed for time, you can wipe your phone and stay offline, just like install Blue Wallet and recover via that or, or use Sparrow on an offline laptop or something wipe it beforehand and then that should work as well at the end of the day i mean those are security measures that are probably uh worth taking if if there mm. are if they are really like life savings um in there um and then don't cut any corners mm. but uh, i mean we haven't seen any actual funds lost through hacks on on like blue wallet or something like that yet so yeah i, I don't know how dangerous that really would be but if it's life savings and you don't have to spend it directly it's uh, definitely worth the wait for just getting a new device that shipped or, or taking a more secure route because mm. i feel like there's a lot of scaremongering around this like you know the what's his name that ledger uh, ceo whatever his name is he's always like just throwing around like oh if, if you have anything on a phone it's gone it's yeah. just like well <laughs> i've never heard of that and I know loads of people, especially in the samurai community, that like, I don't even use a hardware wallet ever. How much of a threat really is this? But then I, I guess you still, if it's your life savings, just want to be 100% sure. What's your thoughts on that Q&A? Yeah, pretty much echo what's been said. I mean, it's it's very dependent on the situation, but the likelihood of you you know, losing a hardware wallet and then within the, the average time frame of being able to obtain a new one, what's that going to be, a week or two? Uh-huh. Needing to spend from your deep cold storage is very very slim yeah if you were really in a pinch and the nature of why you need a new hardware wallet let's say it got stolen and you genuinely think that your funds are at risk yeah would i then throw that into a a phone or a a software wallet to sweep the funds yeah absolutely if i deem that risk to be greater than the fact that i've lost my hardware wallet because it's i flushed it down the toilet and i know it's completely balked then no mm. i'd probably just wait so it just depends on the situation but yeah completely agree you know i work for a hardware wallet company and i will openly agree that the mobile wallet risks are, are vastly overblown with that said you know part of the bitcoin ethos is that you know you prepare for the worst so unless you're really pushed for it why even if there's a 0.1% chance that your phone could be remotely accessed and somebody can extract mm. the seed, then it, why would you take the risk? Yeah, it's I just, agree. It's very dependent on your situation. And for most people, the, the short answer is just wait. Yeah, what I always worry about with things like that and why I would always use hardware, specific hardware made for that job that's offline is like, what if there's a bug or some way that someone can exploit and they're just sat on it waiting and they're just thinking, well, when there's enough to take from enough people, that's when I'm going to exploit this. It's like an unknown issue which you could get away from for not a huge amount of money or effort. That's why I'm like, yeah, it's not for me. Yeah, and that's especially true of completely closed-sourced ecosystems like Apple and iOS. Mm. at least with with android and running an open source alternative you've got a little bit more of a gaze into what's kind of going on on that device yeah uh, i'm not saying it's the holy grail because it's certainly not and it's probably still vulnerable to certain attacks remote attack potentially and that the yeah. kind of thing uh, assessing that is way above my pay grade but like you know it just harked back to the the importance of of open source software so that at least the few galaxy brains that can verify the code and to see what's going on are able to do that and in theory would raise a red flag for the normies mm-hmm. like us to act upon. Yeah, and either way, if you do import your cold storage seed with uh, life savings on it onto an online device, um, for whatever reason, it's always best practice to, to sweep that and to set up a new wallet um, afterwards. Because even if you delete the app, uh, on your phone or on your desktop or whatever, um, you know you can never be sure really what data um, yeah. may have been either extracted or just is still stored somewhere to be mm. extracted in the future. So you might as well um, take that route of setting up a new wallet then for that. Good point. The next on the list is BitGo. They have now um, opened up the first Music 2 implementation. Um, obviously, BitGo is not uh, 
the the champion we wanted to see here. Um, it's obviously a custodian. Um, it's only for their hot wallets, so this is um, not something that I'd advise to use. But generally, it's nice to see that like the incentives work of uh, music. Um, this is like the um, new multisig standard enabled by Taproot and Schnorr Signatures, uh, Merkle Tree hashes. Um, So there are like fee savings and also like privacy enhancements uh, because your single sig transactions look exactly the same as your multi-sig transactions. That's a big one. Yeah, it's it's great to see like a custodian like that um, implement it just because it's cheaper um, and and more secure, um, even though the privacy enhancements in a way because you have zero privacy towards BitGo. Um, it, that's uh, maybe a bit overblown here, but yeah, it's, it's a first mover and I'm really, really looking forward to, to seeing this uh, grow throughout the ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's like you said about incentives, especially with the fees for, for a company like this where they're doing larger transactions and they've got multiple signers. They're claiming that they're going to save up to 30% on fees, which hopefully they're going to pass on to their to their customers as well. When compared with native SegWit, which is kind of the the default um, address format type, that's not always going to be true for traditional users like us. Uh, the savings are much smaller than that, but it does uh, it does start to scale up once you kind of start using larger wallets and and multiple signers and stuff. So yeah, great to see incentives playing out, and uh, be interesting to see the feedback on this, if any. That um, you know, they're a quote unquote uh, shitcoin company uh, and they're one of the first out the gate to, to implement this, um, showing the, the Bitcoin only companies how to do it. So interesting. Next is Envoy, the 1.3.0 big list. Uh, so I included a few points here, but uh, Q, you can definitely um, expand on that. Um, but one thing that we already uh, touched on beforehand was uh, redeeming Azteco vouchers within the app. Yeah, massive laundry list of kind of general quality of life improvements here. Azteca was the big one. Um, So now literally with uh, a scan of a QR code, which is presented on the receipt of an Azteca voucher, you can claim that voucher and receive it directly into any account that you've got within Envoy. So that could be a hot wallet. That could be any of your passport cold storage accounts as well. So you can withdraw straight into your deep cold storage if you want to as well. So super happy about that one and kind of fits with our, our ethos of you know supporting no kyc alternatives um so that was a, that was a big one uh the other kind of headliners would be the ability to cycle through fiat btc and sat which is kind of a pretty standard in most wallets these days so good to get that over the line and the ogs that have been rocking the founders edition passport devices can now complete their firmware updates within envoy as well just like they can with the new one Oh, and by weirdly, by popular request, the Malaysian ringgit currency has been added to Envoy as well. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Didn't know there was that much demand for it, but it turns out there is. So, uh, hi, Malaysia. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Just on the uh, Azteco stuff, I remember a while ago where you could, I'm pretty sure it was like Poundland or something, you could get them in the UK. Is that back on? Is there anywhere in the UK where you can get these, or is this more for the American market? It's for the global market, but the specifically the pound one, pound land one that's dead in the water. Um, mm. I don't think there was any comms to suggest why that was the case. My guess is they probably got spooked by the potential regulatory risk and it disappeared. But yeah, Azteco is technically a global company. I mean, it does have vendors all over the world. The best thing to do is to go to their website and they have literally just got a map on there and you can zoom into your local area or wherever you are um, and see who who's nearby. And then you can go and check them out. But uh, yeah, it's not great in the UK at the moment, unfortunately. Okay. What's the premium you pay like on, a, on an Azteco voucher? Do you know? Good question. That is in the guide that BitLevy's just done on my website. So uh, I'll do a self shill and say it's in there somewhere. I feel like it was like 8% or something, wasn't it? Yeah, let me just check. I'll uh, pull it up now because he kindly included that. I think it's kind of split fees where Azteco takes a flat fee and then whoever the vendor is will add some on top of that based on whatever they want. But let me just confirm that really quickly. Uh, what the fees? Individual retailers selling Azteco vouchers establish the commission fees. You can view the commission and network fee at the bottom of your voucher. Ah, okay, so it's up to the vendor basically, and you may not be able to 
find that out beforehand because you have to hand over some cash to get hold of the voucher in the first place. It may be listed on their website. Uh, I'm not sure. So you, you're probably just going to have to have a poke around to, to see what that is. But I think um, the average is probably somewhere between 5 and 10%. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's definitely pretty standard. reasonable for like uh, having the option to pay in cash. Um, Absolutely. Right now, yeah. it's uh, still fine to walk around with a mask and some sunglasses. Uh, so it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Before we jump on to the next part, that's reminded me, now we're talking about buying some sat. I have had some messages, fountain messages from last month's episode and one of them was from ape mithrandir he sent in 8888 sats and he just has a message saying bisk has a cool software update version 1.9.12 you can now clone offers that means you can take an existing offer and copy it to different payment types and currencies example a european could use the same escrow to represent an offer in euro pounds and francs which is quite cool that's cool yes it is quite I cool i missed that yeah because otherwise you need tons of liquidity if you want to be like if you if you want to put up offers in different currencies because uh, you have to then put up escrow in, in all mm. different currencies you know if you're using like a revolut or something like that you can send and receive in different currencies anyway so it just means that your offer is viewable by so many more people without having to have the liquidity. So it is actually, that's quite a useful thing. Absolutely. Do you want to hear a few more messages? Let's go. Before you do, does this mean that you've got it working? Me? Yes. I haven't used Bisc in ages, to be honest. No, no, sorry, the fountain. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> and I fixed it myself. Wow. Okay, tell us a story. Go. So back and forth with fountain team they couldn't fix it deleted the app put it on again deleted it put it on again kept sending all these requests doing all these tests blah 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 wouldn't work no emails would come through to me to sign in again and in the end i think they just probably had enough of me they're like fuck this guy like i'm not dealing with this anymore so i was like fine i have to fix this so i sat and i got out one of my nim phones deleted it off the other phone set it up and it just worked. So don't know how I fixed it, but I did fix it and it's now up and running. Beautiful. Sweet. You impressed? I am impressed. Yes. Very impressed. All right. Not that impressed, but it's <laughs> <laughs> it's working. The only thing is now this is a phone that just sits in my drawer so I don't have access to it all the time. It doesn't come out out and about with me. But I have it here. So Ape Mithrandir, that was his message. We also had from letter 6173, 7,777 sats. Every episode is based as fuck and full of insights. Thank you for all the dedicated hours of content. Barn Miner, thank you. Wait, 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 wait. You need to do the John Barn Miner thing. I don't know if I'd do it justice. <laughs> Barn Miner. There we go. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you, cunts. Good stuff. Bon, 1,337 sats. A pint and a bag of pork scratchings. What the fuck are pork scratchings? <laughs> <laughs> These Canadians don't know how to live, do they? Obviously not. I did not know that was just a British thing. Yeah, I think it is. I'm actually embarrassed to say that I don't actually know what's in them. All I will admit openly before I Google what the contents of them are is that they're probably well, not fat. They're probably not good for you. It's pork fat. Is that is that literally all it is? I think so. They probably have some sort of preservatives or things to dry it out, some sort of shit in there as well. But I think it's just um yeah, like pork crackling, basically. Isn't that right? I presume so. I mean, all you need to know is they taste good after a few pints. Oh, they're fucking amazing. What you want to do is when you go to the pub, get a few pints, get a thing of pork scratchings, and then just open it up in the middle of the table and you can just have a few sips and a bit of that, bit of that. Oh, it's fucking delicious. Really salty, crunchy. You need some in your life. Yeah, the contents, I just had a look for some uh, pork rind. Yeah, so pork fat. Salt yeah. flavor enhancer. Okay. Monosodium glutamate, which sounds oh, healthy. Oh, lovely. Mm. And hydrolyzed soya protein. Oof. Very nice. It's delicious. And it's under the carnivore umbrella for anyone who's on that train. There you go. 
I'm sure the eight pints that accompany it are probably not, though. <laughs> <laughs> Pierre's 1,000 sats. The signal is strong. This is the way. Mr. Mr. 138 sats. Mining Mafia. User 30331934060964. Giving back what I earned this week. Zeus Moose. 100 sats. Ditch Umbral, long live Citadel OS, and then in brackets, made by the OG creator of Umbral, and check out Geyser Podcast for page of the Qubit node box, which will run Citadel looking super clean. And then Mr. Mister has replied, boo, minus one points. He didn't <laughs> like that comment. <laughs> Lots of Umbral right. fanboys out there. Mm. It does work, but it's not open source, is it? No. So this Citadel one, is that open source? Yes. I think they're going through a rebrand at the moment, but yeah, essentially it's uh, an open source fork of Umbrel. I did run it when they first came out and it essentially looked exactly the same, just with some rebranding. Okay. Did have some stability issues. It was, I think they've just got less kind of dev eyes on it, or they did at the mm -hmm. time at least. But they're going through a rebrand and sounds as though they're looking to do a plug and play box as well, which is good to see. So. Okay. Yeah, maybe um, once it's kind of they finish their rebrand and they finish polishing everything up, I'll give that one another go because uh, I always like to support the open source uh, alternatives. There we are. Well, that's all the messages. I'm going to try and uh, weasel them into the show now. I've got my phone up and running because I am so shadowy. Nice. Next on the list, Nunchuck Android V 1.9.33. They've got uh, now support for tap signer and software keys for BIP48, which is uh, definitely cool. Um, I have not used uh, BIP48 on Nunchuck myself, uh, so I don't know exactly how the, like, the integration is in like, the workflow, but um, seeing that getting more, more adoption is cool, especially for like software keys and the tap signer. What is BIP48? BIP48 is uh, Paynims. No, it's not. No. BIP47, that is. That's BIP47, I'm sorry. Ooh. Bit 48 is just the, the standard uh, multi-sig oh. kind of derivation path sort of thing. I think previously right. Nunchuck was kind of doing their own thing. Um, not sure why. My understanding is that this brings them kind of in line with the way that all the other kind of uh, software signers do, so, sorry, software coordinators do multi-sig. Right. So just kind of, I would presume it makes, you know, going from one to another far easier. Okay, cool. I get confused with my bips. There's a lot of them. <laughs> I absolutely like completely misread like the uh, the context of that update. I was like, man, this is cool. Okay, uh, there we go. Oh, okay, so it's not that uh, impressive. There we go. Yeah. Um, then they've also got uh, export raw hex transactions uh, so you can broadcast them in a different way um so there are multiple services where you can broadcast these as well um so you can export that directly as a raw hex from nunchuck and then also allow mobile to trigger add adding cold card trezor ledger via usb on desktop i don't understand that bit i'm trying i've sat there i've read that sentence no. three times over and i don't understand what they've done there allow mobile to trigger adding cold card ledger. So allow a mobile that isn't a cold card treasurer or ledger to do something via USB, which you probably don't want to be doing anyway. Well, what the way I think it might be is that Nunchuck has a desktop client. So I think it might be something to do with having their Android client, which that is the client that we're talking uh, about with the release no. notes here. Maybe like if you've already got a, one of those sign, uh, hardware wallets added to the mobile client, you can kind of add it to the desktop version of it. I, I'm guessing, I don't know. Um, I've just been going over and over in my head. I can't wrap my head around it. <laughs> Because <laughs> the notes yeah. were reading off or the Android version of Nunchuck, but then it's talking about desktop, so okay. maybe uh, exactly. one of the listeners can, who's a Nunchuck user can uh, enlighten us. Oh, or maybe it means that you can add one of those as a signer, but using the USB into your phone rather than onto a desktop. Mm, I don't think that's possible because you need HWI, and I don't think HWI works on mobiles at the moment. Okay, Nunchuck has done stuff <laughs> that are things. So there you are. 
Yeah, unfortunately, just check the release notes again. There's no additional info there. Someone can let us know. There we go. Sparrow Wallet V1.7.8. And this was, um, there are quite a few cool points here. We've got uh, BIP322, message signing uh, for single SIG addresses, including Taproot. So uh, the Ordinals people will be very happy about that. <laughs> exactly. That's about to say. Um, so I, I haven't dug in, uh, dug in too far there, but um, apparently this is uh, with like message signing. There have been multiple different standards and uh, different implementations. And this is an attempt with BIP322 to um, bring them all together and to, to make all the other implementations obsolete for message signing. Um, and it's been around for a while, as far as I know, Cold card has got it implemented and now a Sparrow wallet as well. So we'll see if this one catches on. The standout one for me in this release was the second line, add ZBar QR reader for all QR code scans, which basically means he's, I think he's like changed the QR library that Sparrow uses so that when you're connecting an air gapped hardware wallet, like a CTI or a Passport, or you're signing transactions with those types of devices, the performance of your laptop or computer scanning that device uh, is drastically improved um i've given it a test on one of my laptops and it is a noticeable difference in speed and that the laptop is now able to read the qr codes on the the most dense setting which it never was able to before and obviously there's been no change to my personal hardware it's just that this update to the library within Sparrow has, is just more efficient at passing those QR codes. So anybody that's using an air gapped hardware wallet that interacts with coordinators via QR codes, uh, make sure you install this update because uh, there is a marked improvement there. And a quick public service announcement. This release did introduce a bug in importing compact seed QRs as a hot wallet to Sparrow. There's been some chatter in the Sparrow wallet telegram. A few people have replicated this. So Craig knows about it and he said it's, it's going to be fixed in the next release. So knowing Craig, that will probably be released before Max gets his arse into gear and edits this podcast anyway. So Almost definitely. Yeah. <laughs> if you're reading this, it's probably fixed. If you're reading it, if you're listening to this. Could be reading this transcript. Yeah. Do you know what? That's funny you mentioned that actually. I was reading something about people like optimizing podcast transcripts and I was thinking to myself, who's reading a podcast transcript? There's got to be someone out there. But why? Like, I can't... Just like proper autists who are going to be like, uh, I don't know, they're listening to another thing and then they're reading that at the same time <laughs> just to be more efficient with their time. I don't know. Someone like that, weren't there? Yeah, or people reading translations of transcripts. Mm, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That's fair. If it's in a different language than the podcast itself, I can understand that one. Yeah, okay. I think the transcript struggle, I pay for a service where I can get transcripts from what we're recording on here. But then for me to edit it, I think it might be because we're British, but it's just like, it just spazzes out with a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, like whatever, like, you know, we're talking about pork scratchings in a pint. It will just come up with something completely fucking different <laughs> to that. So um, I need another right AI to fix that or something, but it's uh, all a bit above my head at the moment. You can now also um, rename your wallets. Um, I was not aware that that was something that you couldn't do up till now. Yeah, so previous to this release, you had to go into the uh, Sparrow folder on your computer's file system and then rename the wallet file that ends in MVDB, I think. Um, and then the next time you open Sparrow, it would replicate the name of that file. Uh, cool. uh, now okay. you can do it within the UI. Okay, cool. And there's also um, the set initial fee for proposed RBF transactions. Um, so there's like a minimum relay requirements. Um, so like a minimum fee that you have to set to broadcast the first transaction and then also to bump it if you want to use RBF. And this is like apparently set to the absolute minimum um, so that you don't have to like kind of choose uh, your fee settings when you're using RBF. Uh, they will do this automatically at the, the lowest minimum. Next on the list is uh, PDK. Um, so this is the pay join development kit. Um, this is, um, I don't know, but this, uh, the first of I, that I've heard of it like a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, so obviously pay join um, is like a collaborative transaction between the the sender and the receiver of a, of a payment of a transaction where the receiver also provides some inputs and um, there's been some push over the last uh, couple of years to for, for wallets to implement this uh, but apparently there's been some difficulty um, getting this done so uh, there's now this development kit um, a bit similar to like the lightning development kit or bitcoin development kit so it's basically just like a toolbox uh, for different projects to easily implement uh, all the functionalities and not having to rewrite all the functions and so on yeah, very good to see. PayJoin's been, with the exception of a couple of wallets, has been lacking in adoption, probably because it's difficult to implement. Obviously, the exceptions are Sparrow and Samurai, who have kind of got their own version of PayJoin, um, looks exactly the same on chain. The kind of BIP78, I think, version of it, which is the one that BTC Pay Server uses, is pretty much not implemented anywhere other than, uh, I think... Wasabi might do it and Blue Wallet. But the massive sticking point is to receive, you need basically a web server. You need to be always online, which most people are not. I've got one, mate. You've got one? Yeah, I've got one for ungovernable misfits. Ah, yeah, yeah. So perfect example of where it makes sense because you've got a storefront um, and a, behind that is a BTC pay server that's always online waiting to take payments. That's the perfect opportunity. Yep. And, and, you know, I would urge anybody that does is in that similar situation that's running BTC pay to, to switch that on. All you need is a turn the toggle on and have a hot wallet on your server. Obviously, you need to be mindful of managing funds on a server, but... In terms of end user applications, it's been few and far between, apart from the exceptions I've, I've already mentioned. So hopefully having a, a development kit, this one's called PDK, is going to make it slightly easier for um, wallet developers to, to have more of a turnkey approach to lower the barrier to entry for them to be able to, you know, at very least be able to support paying to merchants like Max, who's got a web server that's running and always listening for a pay join payment. Since we've switched it on probably about a year ago maybe 18 months ago something like that we have been literally inundated we have had maybe one i think at foundation we've had the same staggering numbers <laughs> it was probably you buying something from me and me buying something from you as well there you go what are like your views on on this like in general um like do you do you see a future for it I like pay join. I did one yesterday with Brother Rabbit, sat in the park. Yeah, I think um, it's proven that it can be done. It requires interactivity between the two participants. Uh, the Samurai and Sparrow ecosystem have demonstrated that that is possible uh, easily over tour. Um, you know, Max, how long did that pay join take you? What, 30 seconds? Uh, well, we were recording a podcast to talk people through it. So it took oh, I see. a minute. Okay. There you go. But yeah, we did two. We did one where we were sat next to each other. This was on Samurai, so a different implementation, but we were doing it where we were passing QR codes back and forth. I think there was four or five steps to it. Mm -hmm. He sent me one sat, and then we did it over Soroban, does it for you as if you're not next to each other, even though we were. And that, yeah, took about 30 seconds as well, and I sent him one sat back. It was pretty cool. Yeah, so it's possible. Um, I think... Is there a desire for it in the wider ecosystem outside the privacy circles? Definitely not right now, but I think you know we, we need to have the tools in place to make that more approachable. And if we can make it the default that, you know, if I'm a Sparrow or Samurai Wallet user and, and I want to pay Max, right now I'd need to send him a Telegram message or a text to say, you know, I'm going to I want to pay you for whatever it is. Can you make? Can you wake up your wallet and put it into listening mode? Mm. If we could do that in such a way where it sort of just wakes your phone up and sends you a push notification to say, you know, Q and A wants to pay you. Do you want to accept yes or no? And then with a single tap, your wallet's then ready to go. It removes mm. it, that little bit of friction that is is left, so to speak, which I think would be would be great for lowering the barrier to entry and making this feel more like like a normal payment. The closer we can get it to that, the better. And that would be cool to see. Yeah. I mean, definitely like with the HRF bounties now, and that's the next point on the list. That's a pretty good segue now um, is they've, they see that uh, similarly. And one of their bounties is uh, serverless pay join. Um, so doesn't that exist already? No. 
Well, at the moment... Well, doesn't it in Samurai, isn't that so? Well, yeah, I was. that was the point I was going to raise. Um, technically speaking, I don't think a serverless pay join is possible because you, you need two wallets to communicate. The Samurai slash Sparrow ecosystem does that through Soroban, which is a Tor-based uh, communications layer, which is running on a server somewhere. I guess you could make the argument that doing it via the OG method, the QR codes. Um, yeah, that's serverless. Yeah, that's serverless. Whether that fits the bill for the bounty, I, I have no idea. Um, I'm not sure what their mm. intentions are there, but technically speaking, yeah, I suppose you could make that argument. Absolutely. Is it possible to do it remotely, you know, from me at my house and you at your house, Max, without no. a server? I, I don't know if it is, and it certainly doesn't exist right now. I think like the the intention here was to have something where the receiver does not have to be online at all. And I mean, I've I've heard one suggestion which kind of fits, but doesn't really fit, <laughs> which is to have a server that just stores the messages um, encrypted, so that the other part, so one side initiates, and then at some point when the other side comes online, they can bounce it back, and then so there'd just be like a time delay between the two. You can do this over like a, a longer period of time, but they don't both parties don't have to be online at the same time when doing the payment. But I, I don't know if this would uh, suffice for this bounty. Maybe uh, going a bit uh, further for the, the HRF bounties. Um, this is, the, the thing was a couple of weeks ago, they announced that they'll be um, putting up bounties for a total of 20 Bitcoin, or actually it's 22 Bitcoin for 11 different uh, bounties. And there's still running at the moment. I think it will be over in 516 days. These are different requests that they've gathered um, out of their like um, large community and the activists um, they're, they're working with and their needs and requests. So they've put out um, 11 total bounties with two Bitcoin each. And uh, this is pretty big i mean there's a that's a lot of cash um going around um i can just like quickly run through the list of, of bounties and then you can uh you can choose what you you find most interesting um is the open sourcing the design guide serverless pay join end-to-end -end encrypted nostra group chats silent payments human readable offers self-custodial mobile lightning address that one is interesting to me Again, I don't know if that's possible. I mean, I guess that's kind of the point of the bounty is to explore somebody to some clever, clever person to explore that. But again, lightning address is the concept of, you know, you have something that looks like an email address, uh, like max at bitbybit.com that compatible lightning wallets can kind of use as an, a, a, a wayfinder to get to your node and ping it for an invoice to send you some sats. The nature of that is that you need a web server to do that. So this bounty is a self-custodial mobile lightning address. So if it's mobile only, how are you going to, mobiles are not online all the time. So how are you going to be, how are you going to have that kind of quote unquote email address online available for people to kind of ping to be able to get invoices from your wallet? I can't wrap my head around how anybody would be able to achieve that given the current kind of mobile ecosystem and the way that they work. Like that's just not how it goes. Could it not be one of these, and I'm probably going to talk absolute <laughs> shit here, but could it not be one of these like progressive web apps that's running on your phone all the time and then because your phone is on all the time, then you can receive the payments and because they're probably not going to be large payments, even though it's not as secure as other options, maybe it doesn't matter because it's a tip or something? No, so progressive web apps are just like, you visiting a website that is made to so it's look connected to a server. Yeah, yeah, that is made to look yeah, yeah, like yeah. an application. Mm. That's kind of like the the receiving end of it, not the kind of always on and listening bit. So I mean, mm. you know, if somebody can achieve this, I think it'd be fantastic because right now one of the main reasons that ninety nine point nine nine percent of people on Nostra that have their zap set up are all using Lightning Address, which is backed by yeah. a custodial solution like Wallet Satoshi, etc. Yeah, because it's the only option because I tried to do it with Phoenix. I set up Phoenix finally and then I was like, oh, I'm going to switch across to this and you can't fucking do it. So I've still got to use my, um, I just use my fountain one because I've already 
got it being used. So I put that on to receive, but then I send from Phoenix, which just seems a bit, I don't know, odd. Yeah, so here's a bit of homework for you, Max, because you've got an always on server. You've got your BTC Pay server running. There we go. With your mm-hmm. nice pay join. They've got a plugin in there that's called Lightning Address. So it would be uh, easy for you to do that. Okay. You should be able to do that with the click of a button, basically. So what's the domain that your BTC Pay is running at? Is it like ungovernablemisfits.com? Probably. This is Mr. Crown's uh, yeah. see, area see, of expertise. You could have Max at ungovernablemisfits.com. You just need to configure that in your BTC Pay server. And then because that's uh, okay. always online, it's a web server, it's it's listening all the time, waiting for payments, etc. When I go into my Phoenix or my Zeus and I say, you know, pay to Max at Ungovernable Misfits, it's already there, it's available, waiting and, and it, my wallet will be able to ping it for, for an invoice and I can, I can send you. it. There's no no kind of direct interactivity between you and I required to kind of manually share mm-hmm. Lightning invoices. That's on the list. That's what I did. And it actually works pretty well with the BTC Pay server. The one thing I can definitely recommend is setting up a new store for it within BTC Pay <laughs> server because it's like absolutely swamped like my invoices page. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> in the shop. Because <laughs> like every every time someone clicks on Zap but doesn't actually Zap you, there's still a new invoice created. Yeah, mine's exactly so the you same. you get like pages and pages of this stuff. Um, Which so, you, can yeah. fil- you can filter out, by the way, to only look at the paid stuff. But yeah, it's, I, I get, I, get yeah. I know where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there we go. That was number six. Um, then we've got seven is mobile border wallets. Yeah, our friends, Mr. Super Fat Arrow and uh, MTC behind this one. Be interested yeah. to see this implemented uh, in a mobile solution. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Mr. Super Fat Arrow takes that bounty himself. What's the bounty? Two Bitcoin. There we go. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Get on that, mate. Yeah. yeah. I'll fucking do it myself otherwise. <laughs> I mean, this is like one of the bounties that seems a bit more, uh, it's a lot of work, obviously, implementing it, but like from a technical standpoint, in contrast to the to what we were just speaking about with like self-custodial mobile lightning address, I mean, that's like conceptually a huge hurdle. But here, this is like just getting a, an app running and, and figuring out the user experience, but the actual like setup is already done. This could be a sweet one. Yeah, mm. the... the um... There's some weird or probably selective language that's been used in some of these bounties where they're specifying it's got to be for a popular iOS or Android wallet. So, you know, somebody like Super Fat Arrow couldn't kind of go out and make his own, uh, you know, fork off from, I don't know, Blue Wallet and make his own Mr. Fat Arrow wallet and then add right. border wallets. They're, they're specifying it's ah. got to be added to a popular wallet but like who defines get it in envoy mate who yeah right but who defines what popular it is like who's making that decision it we just do. seems a bit we do it seems a bit <laughs> strange language to to do that and who gets the bounty mean. if like super pharaoh does like a pull request to blue wallet uh with this would he get it or would like do they have like a development fund? Or like I think it would be him if he's the one kind of making the pull request. And it, you know, the beauty of GitHub is you can see who's done all the work. So I would imagine yeah. it would go to the mm. person making the pull request. It is vague, but I guess maybe there's some sort of community involvement. Like if we all see that he puts a load of effort into it and puts it up there, and then they say, "Oh, that's not what we want," then surely we can give some pushback. I don't know. I don't know how these things work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the next one on the list is pretty ambiguous as well uh, with uh, easy mobile multi-sig. Like we already, yeah, uh, we have this already in two mobile wallets. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, the only caveat there is that they're not fully open source on all uh, platforms. So maybe that's the only thing that they'd have to do. Blue Wallet is? Uh, blue, ah, I was thinking of uh, Keeper. Uh, oh, and yes, you've got Nunchuck as well. Yeah, Nunchuck and Keeper, and Nunchuck, I mean, is not open source on iOS. Ah, yeah, good point. Um, oh, actually, no, didn't and... they? I think that might have changed recently. Keep talking. I'm just going to double check okay. on that one. Yeah, because, I mean, that would obviously be, be a slam dunk. Um, if I mean, especially for Keeper. I mean, they've got a pretty nice setup, but still closed source. I mean, it's still it's on their roadmap, so I don't know if, like, the timing is here, like, if it's just the first one to do it, or if they just wait for the... 150 days to to be up or no 500 days to be up and then see what's happened and and pick and choose i'm not quite sure of how they're gonna go along with that but yeah are each of these 
the same bounty? Are they all two Bitcoin or are they... Yeah, they're all two Bitcoin. Um, the only one that's a bit more complicated is... Well, number nine first is Frost Multisig Wallet. And then number 10 is Cashew. And that is split up into like four different points with 0.5 okay. Bitcoin each. So they've got like um, 0.5 Bitcoin for a fully functional iOS Cashew app. And then another 0.5 for a fully functional Android Cashew app and so on. What's your thoughts on that Cashew one? Because it's custodial. It's not federated, is it? Yeah. So do you not see that as like easily attackable or more easily attackable compared to like the federated stuff? I know Q and A is going to be like, ah, you don't know. <laughs> fucking jump down my neck, but like, I know it's not perfect. But I look at the federated one and be like, if there was a federation and like Q and A was one of the signers, and there was like five or six other people that I loosely trusted enough that. I was like, okay, if one of these tries to coordinate with someone else and say, oh, yeah, should we rug everyone? If I was one of them and I said to Q&A, oh, should we rug everyone? He'd be like, fuck off, you cunt. And then he'd go on Twitter and he'd say, Max was trying to do this, fuck him, this is what happened, blah, blah, and I ruined my reputation. So it feels like there's more, it's safer. I know you, you, you're still not in control completely and it's not perfect, but it, but it's better. Whereas Cashew, I'm like... Well, it's kind of wallet of Satoshi with some privacy. Yeah. Maybe that's mean. I don't know. The main benefit of Cashew is just that it's a lot simpler. Like the the federated yeah, one yeah. is just really complex. I mean, that's why it's taken them like years to, to develop. And like Cashew was built on a weekend. The way I kind of see the use case is more in a smaller group. So that if you're like kind of the uncle Jim or just in your family or like just just smaller groups of people who come together but still want to have privacy but you kind of either know the person who who's behind it or there's more of a an accountability there I see what you mean so it's not just like there's one there's like a honey pot where everyone who uses cashew it, it's all, all the sats are stored in the same place it's like you could run one and then i could be like exactly. oh mate do you mind if okay oh, yeah, i yeah. mean i mean there yeah. probably will be larger ones as well and i mean it depends yeah, yeah. on who who comes together there and obviously you do need a certain amount of people because otherwise um i mean if there's only one user there's no privacy for that person either yeah, so, yeah. um you do need kind of a, a certain amount of people but i don't it's still a, a better trade off, uh, in my view, than than um, something like Wallet Satoshi. Satoshi. Exactly, Agreed, you don't yeah. have any privacy at all. So, if you have a company running one of these services with Cashew, uh, you at least don't give up your privacy, and your risk of losing your funds is is identical with Wallet Satoshi, um, and you'd have the same like convenience benefits. So, it is a step up from that, um, and if we can push like the tons of users of wallet of satoshi at least uh, one step closer to to the ideal setup that's a win in my eyes but um it's definitely far from perfect uh yeah agree on all points um marginally better than than something like wallet of satoshi from a privacy perspective um but the the points that i cannot get over with this sort of stuff is that you just like wallet of satoshi you don't know if they're kind of artificially inflating their own supply because you can't verify that the comparison between like the cashew which is like the single custodian versus the federated one are pretty similar i mean if this is a known entity or group of entities that are running either the the single one or the federated version they're a regu regulatory target because they're a money transmitter and they're a custodian and they're going to get taken down and if they are uh, a nim then um, how do you trust them they could run off at any point do you see that there is a small carve out i agree with what you're saying do you see that there's a small carve out for specific cases? Like I'll give you an example. If you have like the Pleb Miner Monthly group where we've got like 100 people in there, we've got probably 60 of them are NIMS. Maybe there could be a carve out where you say, right, 10 of those NIMS where you would call each other out if anyone tried to rug people. So you have that loss of reputation for small amounts for using it for lightning and interacting and sending each other payments where the amount is small enough that the reputational cost 
would be greater than the rug? Well, from a technical perspective, uh, yes, I see the the very niche carve out. From a, uh, I guess, human perspective, what is the what's the market for that? Who's going to want to do that? Who's going to want to tiny? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, in theory, yeah, I, I, in principle, I agree with you know potentially there are some very niche use cases where that could be useful and 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 an acceptable trade off. Um, but equally, like I don't want to be sat here thinking, you know that you mentioned there about oh just run your own lightning node like that's a horrible experience for 99 percent of the of the the, um of the population it's not the holy grail um so Mm. you know more options are better is it of are these sorts of things of interest to me personally no um but i could see some niche use cases where they kind of make sense i think like you know like um conferences or like you know sometimes you go to festivals and you have to buy those stupid fucking tokens yeah. To, to buy the beer and the food and stuff like that, that might this might be like a good drop in for that where you can you know deposit mm-hmm. some sats and then you get these these e-cash tokens they can't see where you spend them you know it's still a trusted relationship like can you redeem you know if you've got five tokens left at the end of the festival you're still trusting that they're going to give you your cash back yeah. and this is a just a, a more modern version of this with some improved privacy so that's true stuff like that yeah i, I see it makes sense um where you don't necessarily need the same sort of censorship resistance um there are some niche use cases yeah for sure that's fair and the last on the list um well of of bounties here is uh the 11th which is uh bit 47 here we go uh um, expansion (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah they're gonna award one bitcoin each to the first two implementations of uh Bit forty seven in Excellent. once again popular open source self custodial iOS or Android wallets. That'd be good to see. Presumably not those uh, that have already done so. So they're probably biting themselves in the ass that they put it out too early. But <laughs> which is yeah, definitely a kick in the teeth of Stack Wallet that's literally just done it. <laughs> yeah. Um, when was that? Four months ago yeah, or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. So I noticed there's a carve out there for basically for blue wallet because the, it says if a wallet has only send or receive functionality as of july 28th the team can claim half a bitcoin credit for adding the other half of the functionality which is basically blue wallet right. isn't it? okay okay which don't okay. get me wrong you know it sounds like i'm moaning here that would be a win because blue wallet is a very popular wallet so getting the full functionality yeah, yeah. in there would be great um and if we can get two other wallets to, to claim this you know that would total then what we got samurai sparrow stack wallet blue wallet potentially plus another two that's six wallet that's a big part of the ecosystem that's kind of on board yeah, on this um so yeah love to see it and hopefully somebody's gonna gonna jump up and grab this i was pretty shocked to see like how short some of these like descriptions were so it's i mean it, it must be quite a pain to to go through at the end like of like who got like to the to that hurdle of, of passing to get the bounty and to deciding of like who's who's worthy of receiving the bounty like usually the bounties I've seen up till now have been like a lot more elaborative of, of exactly all the different Clearer. options you have to, yeah. Yeah. To, to, to meet. There we go. Yeah, I mean, in general, it's, that, this is really, really cool. I mean, there are a few like bounty programs um, around, but like in this scale of like 22 Bitcoin in total, that's uh, yeah. pretty nice. Cool. Then we've got another uh, point here on on our list, which is uh, that the exchange Kraken uh, was ordered to hand over data to the IRS. uh, And this is personal user data for every user that had like a a transaction history of more than $20,000. Lovely. Hell yeah. And this is names, date of birth, tax uh, information, or like tax numbers, identifiers, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, and unspecified other documents. Uh, so, so whatever like that passport, is. Passport, photo, scan, all Probably. that. Probably, yeah, yeah, Probably. Yeah. That's exactly um, what you want to see. Exactly. Freedom money. <laughs> there we go. Um, I mean, to be fair to Kraken, they did push back and try to fight it uh, in court, but that was uh, rejected. There's one thing that was not specified um, is if it, this is uh, US customers or um, global. 
and if it's just like private customers or also business customers um no idea but um yeah i mean this is absolutely to be expected that this will happen and uh, will will happen to your data if you do this i mean that's why we uh, keep iterating on no kyc but uh you have to assume every single exchange and every single person will go into a database at some point. Unless Bitcoin goes away, which we don't think it will, you can pretty much guarantee that. And those numbers will keep changing. It's $20,000 worth today. We want to watch them, but they're going to be looking at every single person. Even if you've bought a couple of hundred quids worth, they can be like, oh, okay, we're going to want some money out of you, mate. So... Um, stop using KYC services. You can't. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, yeah, don't use them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there's not much else to say. At the end of the day, I'm actually kind of surprised that this is still like goes through courts. Like, I'm at like a point where I like expect that like everyone just um, like all the yeah, and all the the, the big mm. exchanges just hand over all information like in real time. Anyway, uh, that's what I kind of they probably do. This is probably just theatre. Yeah, um, yeah. Who knows? Uh, I mean, it's kind of similar. I mean, uh, we definitely have that here with like um, different services, like non Bitcoin related. Um, if you're like using Airbnb or something. Um, mm. like all that information goes to the tax authorities um, automatically yeah. and so like at the end of the year you just uh, get your pre-filled in tax form and it's all, all already there um, yeah. just as your employer would do too so um, I yeah I'm, I'm definitely operating under the assumption that all activity that you do on like a KYC exchange is is knowledge that the tax authorities and the government has cool um (laughs) um, something more upbeat uh phoenix is really fucking nice i know q a you've been shilling it for the last few months so i thought right i'm gonna try it i was impressed it was really simple and it works and it's nice and yeah i like it a lot yeah fantastic alternative for the people that don't want to have to go through the hellscape of running their own lightning node uh, there are some caveats to that. I mean, you know, as, as I'm sure you're aware, Max, like Phoenix, you just kind of deposit some Bitcoin. It'll do all the channel management bullshit in the background for you and yep. it just magically works. You can send and receive mm-hmm. on or off chain. You pay a small fee, which is very reasonable in my opinion. Is it 1%, isn't it, or something? There's a flat fee for opening a, a channel and then obviously the lightning, ge- generic lightning fees that anybody would uh, incur thereafter. Yeah. So it just works and it's, by far the best option for those um, that don't want to run their own nodes. The the caveat, of course, is that whilst it is non-custodial, non-custodial in the sense that um, you're in control of the keys, Phoenix, Phoenix can't easily steal from you. You are a massive denial of risk, uh, denial of service risk. Um, the only channels that you have between your phone uh, and the wider Lightning Network are directly through Phoenix. Like async, yeah, it's it? async. Yeah, who the company behind the Phoenix wallet? That's why it's so magic because they do all the heavy lifting for you, and you just have like a direct private channel with them. So if they, for whatever reason, and this has never happened, I will caveat that to say, you know, if they somehow decide that they don't want you as a customer anymore, they can just say, no, you're not sending any more Lightning payments, and Phoenix is useless to you at that point. Yes, your funds are not mm-hmm. going to go missing. Um, so you know, you you're not going to be stolen from. But you are putting all of your eggs in one basket in in terms of like everything is going through them. That's a, both a pro and a con. Obviously, it, it's a pro that everything kind of just works and it's really fucking easy. But it's a con that you mm-hmm. know if if they decide that they don't like you, they could in theory just say no, we're not rounding your payments anymore. One question mm-hmm. I have there: they also do the verification, right? So at the end of the day, you're not doing any transaction verification on your phone. So they could give you wrong information uh, that way too, right? Uh, no. So there, there's a lightweight node um, on your phone that has a, and that light, lightweight node has a direct private channel to the, the beefy kind of uh, async node. Um, but they're the yeah. ones that are doing all of the um, heavy lifting in terms of like finding routes for your payments and stuff. So it's it's not a private option. They can see where all your payments are going. 
Okay. Does that answer your question or by? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, well, I mean, the the connect if the only connection is to their node, then you're still relying on the information that you're getting from them, like your verification of a of a transaction. Uh, so if there's a an on chain or a um, also incoming lightning transactions, the only information source is for, directly from their node, right? Uh, no, because the uh, I don't know on the specifics of that actually, because it depends what functionality the the quote unquote lightweight node on your phone has. Like, is that plugged into the gossip network, and is it kind of? Yeah. Uh, I I don't know to what extent that's it's being offloaded. Beard, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting point. I assume it is because there's a little option here where you can run it over Tor. So if it's not part of that network, why would you need that? Or is that so that you're protecting your IP from Phoenix. Yes, yeah, it'll be that. That's why that Correct, is okay, yeah. fine. But yeah, also, regardless, it's um, there's no excuse for someone running Wallet of Satoshi anymore because this is so fucking simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's not absolutely perfect and there's ways that you can improve always, but it's a hell of a lot better than that and, and you have uh, less rug risk. And it's just got even better, actually. In the last couple of weeks, they've uh, released a beta version of the, the an updated version of the app uh, that introduces uh, a technology called splicing, Hallelujah. which is basically the ability to uh, change the size of your Lightning channels. So in the currently... Uh, current version of of phoenix that's out right now that's not the beta one basically when you receive for the first time phoenix will open a channel roughly equivalent to how large that receive is if you then try and receive let's say that was two hundred thousand sats and then you then try to receive a further five hundred thousand sats it would work but phoenix would open a second channel large enough to compensate for the second amount the larger amount and you would pay a subsequent fee for that as well so you could get into a situation where if you're receiving a lot of of kind of larger growing amounts you might have lots of channels and incur more fees than than is necessary there and kind of those channels kind of sit in limbo basically you might use them once or twice and then they're just sitting there which makes Mm -hmm. phoenix not very scalable because obviously they're doing all of that and passing the fees on to you so if the fees skyrocket then you're going to be paying more and, and Phoenix has a hard time dealing with this um, because they're doing all of the, the kind of heavy lifting. With the new beta, what they do now, uh, they've implemented, and they are the first ones to do this, they've implemented splicing, which given the scenario I've just talked about, instead of creating an additional channel, what they'll do is they'll use this splicing technology to basically uh, move your channel, the, the original, let's say 200,000 sat channel, um, and they will upgrade that to be large enough to take the larger amount. You will pay a fee for that, um, but it means that there's only you only ever have one channel with Phoenix. Um, so right. it makes everything more efficient. You will save slightly on fees, and it does give you the opportunity then to kind of, you can what they call splice in and splice out. So it's not just kind of sizing up the channels. If you want to kind of take some funds out of Lightning and put them back into cold storage, you can do a splice out and take some funds on chain and that will reduce the size of the channel by, I'm not sure That's how cool. it works, but um, yeah. So they've got a really uh, in-depth blog post that explains uh, much more eloquently than I did about how all this works. But this has been a long awaited lightning technology that kind of streamlines things from a user perspective and definitely streamlines things from a, an LSP, a lightning service provider perspective, meaning that they've only got one channel per customer. And I think, you know, it, it also is far more uh, chain efficient. So, you know, you're, not, you're never going to have, when this is rolled out, you're never going to have Phoenix users with like five, six, seven, eight channels, which are all taking up space in the blocks that other people could be using. Now it's just a case of you use Lightning, you keep using that same channel, and as and when you need to receive a larger amount, if it's too big, then we'll upgrade your channel, and it's still only one channel on chain. So that's the kind of big update here and really cool to see. I have actually got the beta on my one of my Android phones. I just haven't got around to testing it at the moment, but from what I've seen on social media, everybody seems to be getting on with it really well, and uh, it seems to be... As always with with Phoenix and Async, they seem to have, have done things the right way and, and have got a really slick implementation. So hopefully if the, the beta continues to go well based on what I'm seeing on Twitter, et cetera, then this should be coming to a main release somewhere near you soon. 
So if I understand correctly, it's now reduced from two transactions down to one, right? So beforehand, you'd have to close the, the channel and reopen a new channel with the right size uh, to have the same result. Well, no. And here, well, you what, can just do it with one transaction. What Phoenix would do is they wouldn't close the original channel. They'd leave it open because obviously they think they, they don't know whether you're going to use that in the future. They just open an additional one. And now the, now you've got two to manage, which isn't very chain efficient. Sure. But if I if if like I have splicing like on my own node, um, and can could use this in the future at some point. Um, if I always want to have one channel open, if I don't have splicing, then I'd have to close and reopen, right? To get the if same. you only want to have one channel to manage, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And here I could only do it with one transaction, so I'm always saving that one transaction yep. as well as the time of of having to to um confirm both that's right okay cool slick hell yeah i wanted to mention or just moan about basically something i saw on no, <laughs> no bullshit bitcoin <laughs> yesterday i think uh the uk government is dangerously close to eroding encryption and normalizing mass surveillance so there's an have you guys heard about this one or not or is this news to you I'm sure this has been talked about for fucking ages, hasn't well, it? Well, yeah. So the headline is the online safety bill. What a fucking stupid name. Is now, is now at the final stage before passage in the House of Lords, and it gives the British government the ability to force backdoors into messaging services. No amendments have been accepted that would mitigate the bill's most dangerous elements. Wow. There's a quote from the uh, electronic... Freedom Foundation, I think the EFF stands for. Uh, if it passes, the online safety bill will be a huge step backwards for global privacy and democracy, democracy itself. Requiring government-approved software in people's messaging services is an awful precedent. So this will affect everybody because normies that use WhatsApp, which is everybody, that's end-to-end -end encrypted. That would mean that WhatsApp or Facebook or Meta that's behind WhatsApp would have to install a backdoor to be able to operate mm -hmm. in the UK. And that's true of, well, most things are end-to-end -end encrypted these days, even if they're closed source. So like Apple's oh, um, yeah. uh, I, iMessage, end-to-end -end encrypted. So Apple would have to do the same. And most of these companies have said, we're not going to do it, we're just going to pull out. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, there's... Well, that's something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hats off to them. Whether they actually follow through with it, who knows? Yeah. Because although, you know, WhatsApp isn't technically a money-making thing to my knowledge from for meta like why would they go through the hardship of, of doing all this and, and violating their users privacy just to, to operate like and i'm sure i think apple have gone on record to say that um iChat is only a iChat iMessage is only a cost to them like they, they don't because of the nature of end-to-end encrypted in theory um it's just a cost burden for them um that they give to their yeah. users why would they go through all of this um rigmarole to, to make it you know uk compliant if this bill passes so just mm. absolutely ridiculous and you know i'm, I'm looking forward to, to being a, a criminal by sending nosta dms and whatnot that are end-to-end -end encrypted because obviously nobody's going to backdoor them <laughs> so just no. yeah how, how that this is ever going to be enforced i don't know i mean obviously the the large companies like whatsapp and and apple are going to have to do something what well, that is we we will have to wait and see but um mm -hmm. They should just have it so that when you open iMessage or you open any of the apps and you're in the UK, it just comes up with your government are criminals. We can't operate here anymore. Move. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the biggest um, finger they can give the, these big companies is to pull out. I'd much rather they did that because there'd be so much more yeah. uproar from the, the NPCs of the world. Whereas if they yeah. just did, you know, they, they rolled over and they put the back door in, people aren't going to care. Even if they tell them in the app, no. they don't give a fuck. They don't care. If they opened iMessage and it said that, or it just doesn't work anymore, they'd be fucking spewing and they'd go to the Apple store and they'd be like, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? And they'd be like, oh yeah, we pulled out yeah. because of your government. That would be far more impactful. Oh yeah. And then people might actually run, I mean, you could do something like Nostra or that Simplex thing. That Simplex, Threema, or... yeah, all of that sort of stuff. There's There's so many good options out there these days. Oh, it's disgusting though, isn't it? So it's just the UK. We're just the worst. Yep. Well, I mean, it's it's coming up here in the EU too. Um, it's been discussed as well to basically ban encryption as well. Again, I mean, it's it's like in the EU Parliament. 
but obviously there's a, there's a long way to go until it's actually implemented or even passed. But regarding like the um, of how to enforce that, I mean, I presume it will be like predominantly via the app stores, right? Um, so you just say like you can't have a certain app in the App Store or Google Play or something like that if it doesn't comply. So you'd only be able to do it like install these apps on devices where you can sideload. But maybe uh, the iPhone yeah. Maxis in the UK might finally capitulate. No, because weren't Apple going to side uh, allow side loading? Didn't we talk about that a few months ago? Maybe this is why they're doing that because they've seen this coming. Possibly, possibly uh, could be. Yeah, there yeah. Because they probably know, oh, UK is not that big a share, but UK and EU, if they see this coming, and they're obviously not stupid, if they're like, right, this is the way they're going to go, and there will be a probably a large proportion of people who would just fuck them off if it went into mainstream news and if they had to just pull out completely and it became a talking point. And so they're like, okay, well, this would be the way around it is to allow the side loading, which means that people will still be able to use their products and they'll be able to run the apps and they still have the market share that they had before, that would be the only way that they win in that situation. So maybe that's why. Yeah. But wouldn't the next step be to just have it as a requirement that all operating systems have a backdoor um, all the way? You can't do that with the open source stuff. And so, I don't know. I don't know. Probably, and everyone's going to have to have a camera in their fucking bedroom. And <laughs> yeah, some people do already, but that would be linked up to the government. So, uh, fight back. Hell yeah. Use open source software. Yeah. Ah, oh, just one final, final thing from me. You remember last month we talked about, I was asking you about. Oh, come on, Max. I haven't done my homework on Start Nine, if that's what you're going to say. Yeah. So I have, because I knew you would have. <laughs> I asked on Twitter, and Start9 basically didn't know what I was talking about. I don't know if it was an intern or what it was on the um, on their Twitter, but I was basically asking, like, if I run this on a laptop as my operating system, will I be able to use Sparrow? What I got out of them was it is your main operating system, so you wouldn't be running Linux and then have this within it. This would be the whole thing. And so... You can't run anything that's outside of their app store. I see. I can't remember exactly, but basically they said someone would have to make this into a file that can be read by us, which Sparrow isn't at the moment. Someone could do that. And I was like, would you not think you should do it because it's best desktop wallet out there? Do you not think that would be useful? And basically they didn't think so. And then a load of people jumped in basically saying, and they're not open source so why are you even thinking about it and i was like ah oh, fine good point i just wanted something easy that i could run on that laptop just for my bitcoin stuff so that idea is now out the window because of that oh well you tried i tried one day i'll get there <laughs> today you're fixing fountain app tomorrow you're a bitcoin core dev <laughs> there we go <laughs> right anything from you antimus um all good. All good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no. Cool. Well, I'll keep you on the line because I'll never be able to speak to you otherwise, but we'll close <laughs> this out. And then um, if you don't mind, if, if you can just spare a few seconds for me, I would really appreciate that. Oh, I know you're busy. Oh, man. Ah, oh, sorry. There we go. See you, guys. Bye. See you. Bye. Catch you next month. I hope you enjoyed that and found it useful. If you have any questions for next month's show, you can reach out on Fountain, send us a boost, and we'll make sure to read it out and answer anything we can in the next episode. If you did enjoy the show and you want to help support it and keep it running, the best thing that you can do is to like, subscribe, follow the show, share it with any friends and family who might find it useful, and stay ungovernable.